So today I'm going to talk uh, about Marmalade, which is um, a new tool that we've been developing. Um, and uh, our interest here is, is not necessarily what's gone before, but actually now once you've normalised and got the data and you're happy with the quality of the data, what you do with those probes that uh, you find a difference. And I'd uh, like to thank the organisers, of course, for letting me talk. Um, so the key thing here is, is that you know, if we have differentially methylated probes um, that we found in our, our uh, experiment, it's the question of what do these mean? And we know that there are different positions on the genome where we understand a little bit more than others. For example, in promoters, uh, you know, there's, there's fairly good, strong correlation with gene expression, but uh, other examples may be in the gene body or actually further in perhaps uh, enhancer regions or even further just completely away from a gene, um, what that change actually means in, in, in real terms um, and what biological consequence that actually has. So the idea here is, is that we, we've got this uh, platform that a number of people are using. As you can see, there's a lot of people here today uh, and they, they like to look in all sorts of different cell types. They, they don't, you know, e everyone's doing a very different study. They're not all doing exactly the same study. Uh, and you know, we've got a lot of public databases available, so we can almost look across all of these databases and try and find whether these methylation changes occur maybe in normal cells in a similar way, so that maybe it's a, a blood-specific change, uh, or that it's actually, this is very similar to cancer, uh, and uh, you, know, you may be looking in diabetes and you've got changes that look in cancer, for example. So this is a slide that I'm, I'm sure Illumina will enjoy. Um, it's essentially uh, the, four, the growth of data sets at 450k, uh, and in comparison to the 27k, you can see the lag uh, that, that uh, we had, that, that obviously the 450k came after, but you can see the uh, actually massive, massive growth that we've got. Uh, and actually, uh, we're not that far away from, from having more 450k data than 27k data. Uh, and of course, as, as alri has already been discussed, there's, uh, there's other examples such as sequencing-based data, but the key problem is, is, is number of samples um, that they can do and, and the cost. So our plan is essentially to uh, take everything that is available uh, publicly and, and make it a lot more accessible for people to use in their studies. Um, and in order to do this, uh, we, we've basically extracted all the data and put it into R. Uh, we've done, while doing that, we've, we've annotated the data as well as um, normalised it at the same time. So hopefully we can... Uh, correct for some batch issues. And this is where we stand at the present time. Actually, this is, uh, this is how good, how quickly we're growing. It's actually uh, already more than that. Uh, and this slide was uh, put, put up uh, made or made a couple of weeks ago. Um, so you can see we're, we're over 8,000 samples. And, and the great thing is, is that we're not just all in blood. We've got brain, we've got uh, ES cells, we've got lots of different types of tissues, as, as well as disease states from Alzheimer's, depression, to uh, you know, lots of different cancers as well. So there's a, there's a real scope for being able to look in a lot of different data sets for what you're interested in. So I'm just going to uh, briefly say that if you have, I know some people here have used Marmalade. Uh, we've just made a massive update um, to the uh, sort of front end, which is the website. Uh, and hopefully it's a lot more cleaner and, and based on some comments it's a little bit easier to use. Uh, and I'm going to try and get this to run. Oh. It's not going to work. Um, essentially this is a video uh, and this is one of the, the big enhancements I think that, that's going to make it a lot more easier to use is that we've got this online uh, sample table and in the, in the top, uh, here we go, in the top here, we have a search field. So you can put in all sorts of things in here that you're interested in. And this will dynam dynamically update, um, which is really, really useful. Uh, so if you're just interested in blood, so this should show that you can just quickly find all the blood samples. And you can use this to export uh, this data set. And then the you use these identifiers here to input the things into R. Um, so one thing that, uh, of course, people are always worried about is, is about batch effects with these kinds of things. And here we have um, a number of different studies that I've just taken, ra uh, uh, sort of random, essentially. And you can see that uh, there's some big clustering here, uh, but it's not essentially, they're, they're coloured by their uh, experiment. And you can see they're not really uh, 
going together with the same experiment. There is some commonality with the experiment, but that's more to do with the reason on the next slide, which is actually why they're clustering, which is uh, their cell type. Um, but what's really interesting I find here is that, uh, so this is a blood type, a whole blood CD19 uh, and lung and brain. Uh, and what's really interesting here is you see this different blood separation of, of what's been labelled as whole blood. Now, if you see, you think, well, that's a batch effect, but wait a minute, there's another batch over there from the same experiment. So clearly there's, there's different there's things, although it's whole blood, as we found out, there's clearly something different in terms of the proportion of cells in that blood. Um, and so one thing, so to give you an example of, of something that, you, that we're hoping that people will do, um, we can take, so our idea of something that we're interested in is all the GWAS hits that have been, for example, associated with HDL cholesterol. So we've taken all those SNPs, we've overlapped them with probes, um, basically as long as they're within the probe, so we've not worried about, uh, oh sorry, actually, within a 1KB of the probe. And what's really interesting is we see generally, um, so I should say that this is a plot of all probes by samples, so there's like 8,000 samples going across here. Um, and you've got the methylation state recorded from, from yellow is low to blue high. And we've got this cluster. I mean, I hope you agree that there's, there's three clusters here by the R cluster algorithm. But generally, this, the, these two are fairly consistent, at least. And there's a quite clear cluster separation here. And what's interesting is, is that in cluster three is only whole blood and neutrophils. So the only thing that's, that's in this cluster is whole blood and neutrophils. There's lots of other blood samples in here. But there's clearly a separation for that. And interestingly, we did a quick search, and we found that actually uh, there is some work that's, that's been found out that actually there's a novel role for HDL in regulating neutrophil activation. So that seems to suggest that what we found here by just completely looking in all these samples is we found that there's some interest in, uh, with HDL, cholesterol, and neutrophil. And here's a, another example now. Instead of doing lots and lots of uh, probes, we're just interested in one. And we're interested in this probe because it's a uh, probe that contains a SNP. It contains a SNP on the CPG. So it changes that C to a G uh, in, in some of the population. And what's really interesting, you can see the consistency across our data. There's fairly good consistency here. Um, and it, the interesting bits for me here are these bits that are standing out. And what's weird about this is that these are ES cells and IPS cells, uh, but also these aren't all up and down. So this is actually based on what cell line they've been derived from, which I also find quite good. And then we can check in other data. There's some NK data of uh, H3K27 acetylase. And you can see all these different cells. And this green one here, actually, uh, right there, is uh, completely knocked down. Uh, so that sort of builds up. And what's interesting here is this is in the promoter region of a long, non-coding RNA. And then, of course, we can check what the neighboring probe for this one's doing. And interestingly, this neighboring probe shows exactly the same uh, profile with the ES cells. So what we found here is a SNP that is, is known to exist in the population that clearly has some effect um, in terms of this long non-coding RNA and ES cells. And then just to give you uh, one quick example, this looks terrible, but this is uh, uh, another SNP, a very similar idea here. But this time, they, all these are uh, blood-specific uh, SNPs. And what's quite interesting here is a lot of this sort of variation that we're seeing is actually down to, uh, these are all cancer samples, or a vast majority are, of them are, or certainly related to uh, people with cancer. So uh, you can see that we can get quite specific, uh, a SNP that's quite specifically associated with blood. And actually, uh, this gene, again, is uh, a, a TAP1, I think, if I remember correctly. And uh, mutations in that gene are, are associated with diabetes and, and uh, other, other uh, like celiac disease, other autoimmune diseases. So you can see that um, what, we, what we found is what we're interested in here is we may have a methylation difference, but we can sort of relate it back because we can then find, well, that's associated with blood specific differences and that you can bring that all in and, and uh, get functional consequences out of this. Um, so with that, I, I would like to thank uh, my supervisor, uh, Valvin Ratkin, and uh, my funding was uh, from, or still is, and uh, will continue to be from Blueprint. Uh, and you can email me if you have any questions or come and talk to me in the breaks. Uh, I should be a bit more free now. Uh, and the website is marmalade.org. It is live now. You can go and uh, access it and 
please, if you have any problems, uh, do email me. And thanks for your attention. Hi, that was great. Um, I was just wondering, do, do you have any gene expression data paired with any of these samples? And if not, are there plans to have um, additional data sets, either for gene expression or other types of omics, um, to allow comparisons? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. At the moment, we've, um, we've uh, just built this for methylation. I know there are some gene expression other data sets out there. Um, we haven't uh, plans in the near future, but certainly in the longer term to incorporate as much, as you can see, as you build in more data, you can definitely get more information in, and that's something that we need to do. But the, the advantage really, I mean, one of the problems with gene expression is almost that so you've got lots of different arrays doing different things, and people now doing RNA-seq, and it's very hard to actually combine it all in. Whereas with the 450K, it's pretty much like get the beta values, do some normalization, and it's all very consistent. Uh, and actually, even raw, even most of the raw data is, is fairly good. Um, so that's, the, that's really why we can do this for methylation. Uh, but there's some hope in trying to do something for expression, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the question, uh, just for uh, repeating it, was uh, do we use the IDAP files, the, the sort of raw data, rather than uh, sort of some of the process data? We, we take in uh, essentially uh, beta data um, because that is what everyone has to do to uh, put on GEO. Um, there is, um, I am going to start because I think IDAP, so if I can encourage people while, while we're here, Please submit your IDAP files when you submit to GEO or anywhere else, because that is what we need to do. Uh, I really think that. Um, and I, I actually want GEO to start making that a, a forceful thing. But um, that is something that we're going to add in. So what we're going to start doing is the samples will, at the moment, you can use raw and normalized data. So if you just want to use the raw beta values, you can without our processing on top. And then we're going to add a third layer where you're just going to have the intensities for what's available, but obviously that will reduce the number of samples down quite a lot. And follow up on that is um, the annotation of these files. I mean, that GEO is a very loose format, right? Can you go through all these files and extract, for example, in fact, it's easy, right? You can um, get that on the data itself, but age, uh, for example, is yeah. hard. Well, so we, we uh, the moment we're, we are uh, predicting sex based on some, so that's some data that I didn't show, but we can, uh, there's some cross hybridization probes on the 450K, and we can actually, so often what people don't include the sex chromosomes, they just throw it away and they don't in include it. Um, so, but we've actually used some autosome cross linkage to predict sex, uh, and that's not in the database, but it will be very, very soon. Um, in terms of age, obviously, we can use some of these aging models to try and predict it, but we basically hand annotate most things. Uh, and go through each file and try and take out as much information as submitted. We are stuck by the fact that people don't always annotate very well. And actually, I've been finding quite recently that I think we may have to have another cell type thing, which is our cell type prediction. Uh, because some people may say it's whole blood. It doesn't look like it's whole blood. Let's put it that way. So I think um, it's limited by annotation. It always will be, but we, it's the best we can do. So.